Hello everyone and welcome to the week two supplemental lecture on Jean and John Komarov's writing theory from the south. If you've chosen this as your reading this week, you've found the shortest reading uh, for the week, but not necessarily the simplest. They use a lot of language here that's quite complex and can be a little bit difficult to parse if you're not familiar with it. Uh, quite a lot of it relating to how they characterize capitalism. I'm not going to go into huge detail on those aspects of their argument. Uh, I want to pull out instead the bits of their argument that relate to our themes for this week, which have to do with enlightenment and universalism and the relationship of those claims to universality to the way in which other parts of the world are also affected by the Enlightenment. We'll get to issues of capitalism and how to conceptualize it in later weeks of the term. Okay, so the Komarovs start with Western Enlightenment, and as we've discussed in other podcasts and as will come up in other readings this week, um, they talk about it as something that understands itself as of universal significance, as relevant for all human beings everywhere, uh, even though the thinkers in it reside in a particular location themselves. And they say that the Enlightenment understands the non-West by contrast, and the non-West might be the historical past, or it might be non-Western parts of the world at the time, at the present time. But the non-West is understood as a place of parochial wisdom, they say, antiquarian traditions, exotic ways and means, and then a lovely phrase, above all, unprocessed data. It's a lovely way of characterizing it. So you have Western science, uh, Western explorers, going out and taking the rest of the world as their data something that they stand above, they're not fundamentally inside of, and that they're going to look at as if from a great height and analyze, make the subject of their analysis. And what they say is rather than taking this north-south divide for granted, rather than taking the west-non-west divide for granted, uh, is there some way that we can understand its historical contingency, the forces that generate it and the forces that keep it happening in the present time? And they make a contrast that's quite interesting between mater modernity and modernization. Now, this week, a number of the texts that we've been reading are particularly concerned with modernity. Modernization is a term more often used when we're thinking about economic development, sometimes political development. And we'll look at some texts uh, around the midpoint of the course and going on toward the end of the course that are more interested specifically in the theme of modernization. But they go on to make this contrast and define these two terms, and when they define modernity, the things they're saying should largely be familiar to you from the podcast that we've had on Kant, uh, and the general things that uh, Kant discusses as characteristic of the Enlightenment. So they talk about modernity, it sounds like it's a temporal category, it sounds like it has to do with where we are in time, but they say that's not the best way to understand it. What it really is is an orientation to being in the world. It's a way we comport ourselves uh, as being part of modernity. And included in this, and again this should be familiar to you from the Kant, is a concept of the person as a self-actualizing subject. So someone who can govern themselves, who can realize themselves, who has responsibility for themselves, who has a level of independence and autonomy. It's also associated with concepts of history as progressive and man-made. So there's a great contrast, a very strong contrast, that develops in, in the Enlightenment, and we'll also talk about it in relation to classical liberalism next week, that contrasts the natural world, which is understood as a self-regulating sphere of objects governed by natural laws that have nothing to do with humans, versus the human world, the social world, the governmental world, uh, which is understood as contingent and man-made and as a construction. And they say specifically there's a notion of that man-made history as somehow progressive. There's a developmental line that runs through it. And that progress in human history has something to do with the accumulation of knowledge and technical skill. So the idea that you can have a build-up of knowledge and technical skill. It also has something to do with the pursuit of justice by rational governance, that there's some way that we can think about our political institutions and engineer them uh, to generate justice. And this will be a theme that will come up again and again in the course. And then they say a restless impulse toward innovation. All of these things are jumbled together in the ways of being in the world that they associate with modernity. Modernization is a little bit different. 
although there are some overlapping points. Modernization implies they call a strong normative teleology. That's really piling up the huge words. Uh, so normative means that something is perceived to have some kind of moral force or ethical force. There's a judgment involved if you're talking about something being normative. Um, but it also captures the concept of norm in the sense of, you know, you might talk about a statistical norm. There's something to which you're meant to conform, something that is the standard uh, type of development. And teleology, and this is a term that will pop up in some of the other works that we read across the term. If something is teleological, it means it's driving toward a particular endpoint. And there is often a belief that the endpoint was already always contained within the process at the beginning. So if history has a teleology, it might have always been moving in a particular direction. And the direction in which it's moving, the thing that it was meant to culminate in, is understood to cause the course of its development. So we'll look at some teleological theories of history as we go forward in the course, um, but there's sort of notions that history is meant to culminate in capitalism or communism or democracy. And if someone believes that whatever history is meant to culminate in is almost like a driving force of history itself, you can say that they are teleological in their understanding of history. So for the Komarovs, modernization has that teleological element. Modernity doesn't quite, or at least they think it doesn't necessarily. It has a notion of history as progressive, but to them that's not the quite, quite the same thing as saying that there is a teleological endpoint that that progress is aiming toward. And I think the one has more possibilities and better possibilities than the other. Modernization, they say, implies a unilinear trajectory toward the future. So there's one path of modernization, and countries can lie at different points along that path, but it's the same path. It's just where you are on it. But again, they don't think that the concept of modernity is necessarily so linear. Okay, so there is still a notion of progress, there's a notion of doing better, there's a notion of improvement, but it's open to the possibility that there might be multiple paths, they're suggesting. Modernization has a notion that whatever the teleology is, whatever the linear trajectory is, it involves an endpoint to which all humanity ought to aspire, to which history ought to lead, to which all peoples ought to evolve. So that very strong ought is what they mean by normative. This is what should happen. If it doesn't happen, then something has gone wrong with the process, but the ought is still there, the normative force is still there and it goes to a single endpoint. Modernity, by contrast, I think, is more flexible, more fluid. It has a progressive element to it, but it's a concept that I think is more amenable to multiplicity. And having said this, having made this distinction, they say, you can desire progress. So they're positioning themselves. They are not anti-progress. They are not romantics. They do not want to go back to a time before modern technology or whatever else, you can desire progress while still seeing its destructive effects. Okay, so the fact that you are critical of some of the impacts that progress has had doesn't mean you're anti-progress for them. And it is also possible to recognize multiple versions of progress. So there's not just one way. So they are critical of modernization theory, but they want to capture and keep something from the concept of modernity. And they're not the only thinkers this week who want to do something like that. And then they say they've got two main arguments. The first one of which is that modernity in the South is not some sort of derivative copy of what's going on in Europe and the United States. Okay, so they've already set up the idea that there might be multiple modernities that are all equally modern. Modernity in the South, they're going to say, has its own dynamics, its own originality, its own force, its own creativity. And then they say the South does not lag historically behind the North. Okay? The South, in whatever state it is in currently developed or underdeveloped, it's not because it's historically behind. There is a modern history where these countries are all equally modern to each other. Um, but some of them have been made 
to develop in particular ways and others in other ways. Because of the distinctiveness of how the South has developed, they say it is often the first to feel the effects of world historical forces. Okay, so the North, by which they mean the sort of wealthier, more developed countries, often can buffer themselves against dramatic global crises and change in a way that the South, by which they mean countries that are less developed or less wealthy, has greater difficulty doing. And they say that that makes it a kind of a bellwether. Things happen there first, certain kinds of things, and therefore strategies to deal with those things are developed in the South first, because the buffers are not present there that can be in the northern countries. And specifically, they're interested in capitalism, and they talk about capital and labor in new configurations. They talk about dynamism and fluidity, and a process that we'll look at next in the next couple of weeks, uh, where we're looking at capitalism understood as a process of creative destruction, uh, where you have changing configurations of institutions, of populations on the ground, driven by changing relations of capital and labor. And these changes, they say, drive the development of new forms of culture, society, economy, and what they call survival strategies. So because the South is at the coal face, it needs to innovate. It has to innovate. It doesn't have the choice to buffer itself from it. And then they say, as the contemporary capitalist world order, at once global and local and everything in between, catches all and sundry in its web, as its peripheries become its vanguard and its centers mimic its peripheries, so the world is turned upside down. Okay, so we've got this visual image, this terminology that's used of the North and the South. The North is on top, it is wealthier, it is more developed. And they are suggesting actually that exciting, frightening, innovative changes are happening in the less developed parts of the world or in the recently developed parts of the world. And so it's like the center of gravity of the world turns upside down. The traditional north-south image needs to be inverted, they're suggesting. And then they ask two questions, and this is how they end the piece. Where's the south? Okay, it sounds like it's a geographic category, but really it's not. And this is an argument very similar to that that Stuart Hall will make in another reading this week about where's the west? Okay, because the west doesn't really mean the geographic west. The south doesn't really mean the geographic south. There are countries that are located geographically in the north that in terms of their history of development belong conceptually to the category of the south and vice versa. They say, in short, there's much south in the north, much north in the south, and more of both to come. Okay, so these are also not fixed categories. It's not just that there are countries in different geographic places that belong to what would seem like the wrong category, but that they take this to be a dynamic process. The fact that some countries are developed and some rec more recently developed and some less developed, they don't think this is static. It's something that's prone to change. So who fits in which bits of this conceptual apparatus uh, they don't think is going to be stable over time. And so they say where the South is cannot be defined a priori, because it can't be defined before looking at how things are. It can't be defined in substantive terms. The label refers to a relation, not a thing in and for itself. So the South is not something that you can just look at a map and go, there's the South. The South is not something that you can make a decision at a particular point in time, and that's what the South will always be. And because of this fluidity, because it is a relational category, because it is a dynamic category, they say, this is why, in addition, we need theory to make sense of our global situation. So theory is often understood as something that people use because just direct empirical observation is not going to be adequate to help you orient to or interpret what you're seeing. They're making that kind of argument here. And then they say, okay, we've said we need theory. What kind of theory? What does theory mean in this context? And they say that they believe that this is a period where in the global north, empiricism and realism are favored. Theory is on the outer. So there is less theoretical production or less innovative theoretical production going on in the North at the moment, they believe. 
And then they pick up a criticism. They say that theory is often perceived as an elite practice, but in fact it can derive from everyday practice, and they use the term praxis, which is oftentimes a term that is used to refer to forms of practice that are transformative, that are aimed at transformation. So theory can come out of that. And they say the South is a particularly intense place for developing that kind of non-elite theory that's based in everyday practices and in everyday life. And the reason that it's so intense is that it is the site that capital and new forms of capital flows are affecting most strongly right now. So they believe that the South will be a locus for generating forms of theory. And the forms of theory that are generated there are not going to be relevant just to the South, because as they've discussed above, there are bits of the South and the North there are changing geographical boundaries of what is South and what is North. And so these new experiences driven by new forms of capitalism, they think are going to generate forms of theory that are of global relevance.